Welcome to another Big Train Tour at the Colorado Railroad Museum. This month, we'll be taking a look at a passenger car that proudly served on perhaps the finest train to run through the Intermountain West. Today, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe sleeper observation car Navajo is proudly displayed at the museum with a unique history to share. I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director of the Colorado Railroad Museum. Our subject passenger car was built for the Santa Fe and launched the 1937 debut of the streamlined Super Chief, running between Los Angeles and Chicago. Come join me now as we take a look at the history of this stylish classic and how it came to be displayed at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway has a long history of railroading in the American West. First chartered in 1859 as the Atchison and Topeka Railroad, its promoters successfully lobbied to be included in the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862, signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln and intended to facilitate the nation's first transcontinental railroad. With the help of land grants authorized by the Act, the railroad, with Santa Fe now added to its name, reached the Kansas-Colorado border in 1873 and Pueblo, Colorado in 1876. It famously vied with the Denver and Rio Grande over the rights to build through the Royal Gorge to Leadville. The so-called Treaty of Boston between the railroads settled things. The Rio Grande agreed to head west from Pueblo into promising new mining regions, and the Santa Fe agreed to head south into New Mexico via Raton Pass. By 1887, the Santa Fe reached all the way to Los Angeles and San Diego, thanks to a deal struck with a separately chartered railroad, the Atlantic and Pacific. By the turn of the 20th century, the Santa Fe would also reach north to the San Francisco Bay Area. This made the railroad unique. Unlike every other major western railroad at the time, its route was under one single ownership, stretching from California's largest urban areas and shipping ports to Chicago. The railroad became known for its passenger trains starting in the final decade of the 19th century. The California Limited, introduced in 1892 and billed as the finest train west of Chicago, became the Santa Fe's flagship. It featured sleeping cars only, no coach seats. It was joined, beginning at the turn of the 20th century, by a number of other named trains running from LA to Chicago and connecting other specific destinations along the Santa Fe system. In fall 1926, to help ease the demand on the California Limited, the Santa Fe introduced a new train running from Los Angeles to Chicago. Named simply the Chief, this was an extra fare all Pullman train that launched just as the growth of the Hollywood movie industry was booming. For the next 10 years, the chief would carry business executives, movie stars, and discriminating tourists. The Santa Fe would also become known for its depictions of Southwest Indians in posters and promotions, and the railroad's brand became intertwined with romanticized Native American imagery. Pueblo tribes, along with the Navajo, were most frequently depicted. When restaurateur Fred Harvey assumed the railroad's dining service, he would go on to employ architects and artists to depict, collect, and display aspects of Native American culture as well. The Great Depression seems like a terrible time to introduce innovative new passenger trains. But that's exactly what would happen, starting with the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad's 1934 debut of its stainless steel Zephyr passenger train. Propelled by the new technology of the diesel-electric locomotive rather than steam, this train's introduction also set a world speed record. That same year, Union Pacific introduced a streamlined train set of its own, powered by a distillate engine. Also in 1934, several U.S. railroads rolled out streamlined steam locomotives to pull their fastest trains. 
a new kind of race was on, with the aim of rekindling the traveling public's imagination. The Santa Fe Railway watched these developments with great interest. Train travel was down during the Depression, but more importantly, competition from automobiles and buses was increasing. The railroad realized that something radical needed to be done if passenger trains were to regain their popularity. That same year, the railroad was used as a testbed for Alco's new 660 horsepower diesel electric switcher. The Santa Fe soon signed a contract with diesel builder Electromotive to build its first passenger diesel electric locomotives. These sleek but somewhat boxy new locomotives were delivered in 1935 and they spent several months being tested at sustained high speeds and in all weather conditions. The Santa Fe also proceeded to invest millions into upgrading its tracks and signaling systems so trains could run safely at higher speeds. In May 1936, the railroad unveiled its new flagship train, the Super Chief. This would become the first diesel-powered all-Pullman passenger train in North America. The Santa Fe promised a running time of just under 40 hours total between Chicago and Los Angeles for the Super Chief, a significant improvement over the 63 hours required for the same trip by its forebear, the Chief. The railroad was betting on a major competitive difference from the earlier Union Pacific and Burlington streamliners. Instead of creating a shorter train of non-standard lightweight cars with limited services and a fixed capacity, the Santa Fe's new Super Chief had all of the creature comforts that first-class passengers expected. The train could also add or subtract cars and locomotives as needed. The new train was an immediate hit. With its flashy, flat-nosed diesel locomotives pulling a standard consist of so-called heavyweight passenger cars, the train regularly topped 80 miles an hour on its dash across the Midwest and Southwest. But this unique sight was destined to be short-lived. Even as it launched the new service, the Santa Fe was designing an all-new stainless steel train set to take over as the Super Chief the very next year. The railroad gambled that it was a better bet to launch the new Super Chief as soon as possible with older cars, but running on the new fast schedule. This way, it would lead the pack instead of playing catch-up. The gamble worked, and the Super Chief gained a new reputation as the Train of the Stars. It had assumed this distinction from the Chief, which continued to run on its more relaxed schedule. In late April 1937, the Santa Fe took delivery of its gleaming new stainless steel Super Chief train set from the Bud Company of Philadelphia. Dubbed Super Chief II by railroad management, the train would spend the next two weeks on a fast-paced series of publicity trips and public tours. News reporters, entertainers and movie stars, and top businessmen were all treated to a preview of this superb all-new Hotel on Wheels. Even the locomotives were something to behold. Electromotive had created a sleek new type of streamlined diesel electric known as the E-Unit. Clad in stainless steel, just like the train it pulled, the locomotive's units sported flashy styling devised by General Motors stylist Leland Knickerbocker. The artist used bright red to convey a bonnet over the locomotive's nose, which swept back over the cab and curved downward over the car body, narrowing along the bottom as it continued along the side. On the front center of the red bonnet, Knickerbocker applied a yellow circle and cross Native American design with Santa Fe displayed in the center. One final touch, the silhouetted face of a southwestern Indian with a flowing headdress was placed on each side near the center. Yellow and black trim were added highlights. Nicknamed the War Bonnet, the Super Chief's new livery would become arguably the most striking and best remembered to ever grace a locomotive in the United States. The evening of May 18, 1937, the gleaming all stainless steel train departed Chicago for its maiden journey. The train would pass through eight states and cover 2,227 miles on its way to Los Angeles. Since there was literally a single train set in service at this juncture, this exclusive train initially would make just one run per week in each direction, 
This allowed time for cleaning, maintenance, and restocking in between trips. Aboard the train, passengers had been shown to their chosen accommodations as they boarded. Since this was an all-Pullman train, everyone had a private room or an assigned seat within a section that could be converted from daytime seating to nighttime sleeping. After stowing away clothing and other personal items, guests were free to walk through the train to discover its public areas. As passengers toured the train, they were awed not just by its newness, but also its unique and modern design touches. Each of the seven cars, designed by Paul Philippe Cret, Sterling MacDonald, Roger Birdseye, and John Harbison, was inspired by Navajo art. Passengers were delighted to find conversation flowing freely in lounge car Acoma, along with cocktails from the well-stocked bar. Dining car Kachiti featured an extensive menu filled with delicious options, and its first seating for dinner would begin after guests had the chance to settle in. The dining car service was operated by Fred Harvey, and the company's famed architect Mary Jane Coulter had designed exclusive, stunning new Membrano china and flatware. There were five cars offering sleeping accommodations on the train. One of these, car Navajo, located at the rear of the train, was home to not only sleeping rooms, but also a small, stylish lounge for enjoying quiet conversation or maybe even a book. There, guests enjoyed each other's company before and after meals and before retiring for bed in their Pullman accommodations. The train's interior was finished in exotic wood veneers from all over the world. Brazilian rosewood, African bubinga, American redwood burl, the list was extensive and featured over a dozen different types. These could be found highlighting the walls inside drawing rooms and bedrooms, and in the dining car and lounge car. Interestingly, wood veneers were not part of the decor aboard the observation section of Car Navajo. Instead, this lounge area relied primarily on colors, fabrics, and lighting for its sense of style. The Colorado Railroad Museum is indeed fortunate to preserve one of the most famous cars from this very first streamlined Super Chief train set. Observation sleeping car Navajo also just happened to be the most expensive of all of the train's new cars. Navajo sported three Pullman compartments, two Pullman drawing rooms, and one Pullman bedroom in its forward area. These accommodations were all part of the train's extra-fine, extra-fast, extra-fair marketing mantra. Like the rest of the train, these private rooms were decorated in rich wood veneers accented with stylish furnishings. At the rear of the car, a comfortable and cozy lounge space greeted passengers. Since this lounge did not have bar service, it was often quieter and less crowded than the train's main lounge, which was found several cars forward adjacent to the dining car. The Navajo's lounge had the added attraction of being at the rear of the train, with wraparound windows so guests could watch the tracks recede in the distance. The lounge in the observation car featured upholstery fabrics based on Navajo Bayeta Serape blankets. The pier panels on the walls were copies of Mountain Chant sand paintings. Other warm colors enhanced the Southwest Indian motif, such as sand-colored carpeting, copper walls, and a turquoise ceiling. The maiden voyage of the streamlined Super Chief included a good cross-section of the well-known people that this train of the stars would become famous for carrying. Among them were dancers and actresses, society column writers and drama critics, newspaper journalists and book authors, artists and illustrators and cartoonists, singers and songwriters, explorers and filmmakers, hoteliers and businessmen. The upgraded and streamlined Super Chief was a success from the outset. Beginning in early 1938, the Santa Fe substituted a new lounge car for the original Acoma, one that now featured a ladies' shower and a beauty shop, both of which had been lacking from the original streamlined consist. A men's shower plus a barber shop were also now found on a new baggage lounge car, 
and another sleeping car was added, increasing the train's capacity to just over 120 guests total. A second streamlined Super Chief train set was placed in service in summer 1938, allowing the Super Chief to operate twice weekly between Chicago and Los Angeles. Built by Pullman Standard rather than Bud, this new train set, while also quite stylish and retaining the southwestern flavor of the earlier 1937 train set, featured a number of subtle changes. For instance, new sleeper observation car Puye boasted a more vertical rounded styling as compared to Navajo. Puye and its classmates would go on to be pictured frequently in advertising and photos of the Super Chief. The Santa Fe rolled out several other streamlined train sets in 1938. Among these were the new El Capitan, an extra fare but all coach train running on the same fast schedule as the Super Chief between Chicago and Los Angeles. Between LA and San Diego, the new streamlined San Diego gleamed forth. Between Chicago and Kansas City, the set of new trains, the Kansas City and westbound and the Chicago and eastbound, were inaugurated. The railroad's former flagship, the Chief, was also upgraded to streamlined cars at this time. The Super Chief was completely upgraded after World War II, with new equipment and additional train sets introduced in 1948. This allowed the train to begin operating daily between Chicago and Los Angeles. New Sightseer Dome Lounge cars were a special highlight and an exclusive turquoise room private dining area was introduced on each train set as well. The Santa Fe went on to upgrade and re-equip many of its passenger trains at this same time. Unfortunately, the advent of the jet airliner in the late 1950s signaled the decline of passenger trains throughout the U.S. Although it continued to offer first-class service, the Santa Fe Railway could not turn the tide. Older train sets were phased out as the railroad began to cut back and consolidate service. Sleeper lounge car Navajo, which had proudly brought up the rear of the inaugural Streamline Super Chief back in 1937, was retired in 1957 and placed in storage. Luckily for Navajo, the Santa Fe Railway donated the car in 1966 to the Intermountain Chapter of the National Railway Historical Society. Located in Denver, this local chapter of the Nationwide Railway Preservation and Enthusiasts Organization had been established in 1961. For several years, the chapter operated the car in charter service at the rear of the Santa Fe's last remaining passenger train operating between Denver and La Junta, connecting there with the railroad's transcontinental trains, including the Super Chief. In 1971, with the advent of Amtrak, the car was retired from service and moved to the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. In Golden, the Navajo joined another streamlined standard gauge car from competitor Union Pacific. It was moved to its present location on the museum grounds around 1999, as the museum's new roundhouse and operating loop were being completed. Ownership of Navajo was transferred in 2006 to the museum. The car's outward appearance has remained constant over the years, although the interior was partially disassembled in the 2010s. Two other cars from the original 1937 streamlined Super Chief train set also survive. Dining car Kachiti is today a stunning display at the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento, complete with beautiful settings of railroad china, silver, and flatware. Lounge car Akama which remained in private car charter service with Amtrak until quite recently, is reportedly for sale. Today at the museum, observation sleeper Navajo brings up the rear of a short streamlined consist led by a pair of Denver and Rio Grande Western F9 passenger diesels. As museum visitors glance at the car's sleek stainless exterior, they sometimes find the stylized Super Chief drumhead and put two and two together. Surviving from 1937 and hailing from America's famous Train of the Stars, the Navajo is truly a Colorado and Southwestern U.S. railroad icon. Thanks for joining me today. Observation Car Navajo is a lucky survivor 
that changed relatively little during its 20 years of active service. Over the course of its relatively short but glamorous career, it served all manner of the rich and famous, as well as lucky travelers who just wanted to travel from LA to Chicago as quickly as possible prior to the advent of the jet airliner. I hope you've enjoyed learning about this stylish stainless steel observation car. And I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of the museum's collections. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.